Thank you so much. Welcome. Um, and uh, welcome in general to the NME this year. I hope that you've been uh, finding the sessions inspiring, enlightening, um, maybe a little overwhelming. Um, maybe we'll try to do all three today with MediaThread. Uh, we're very excited about it. It's a brand new platform that we've developed at the center. Um, and we had a lot of uh, back and forth about what we should even call it. And uh, Media Thread uh, was the consensus after a long time. And um, it's a little bit of an odd name. But uh, in fact, it is a platform that allows uh, students to thread multimedia together um, in response to discussions, uh, assignments, um, for the purposes of writing essays or other analytic projects. Um, and also, MediaThread defines um, threads within a class in a way that I hope to give you an idea of. Um, as a class that is using MediaThread uh, discovers common points of interest based on common use of objects and uh, coll collaborative uh, working on projects. So MediaThread is brand spanking new. And I just emphasize that in case there's any <laughs> quirk uh, that happens as I try to manipulate everything today. Uh, but in a larger sense, it's nothing new for the center. Um, it is um, uh, the latest twist and turn on a longstanding uh, interest that the center has had of supporting hands-on use of high-quality multimedia materials in classrooms here at Columbia, um, modeling that for people outside of Columbia. Um, We've long been trained on the project of developing ways to look closely at digital objects and manipulate them for analytic purposes. Um, we've long built tools that allow students to organize objects for assignments, uh, that allow them to tag them, um, annotate them, allow them to get their hands on digital objects and clip or edit them. Um, and we've long built projects that are very much learning environments defined by the activities of students as they go about doing these things. Now, if you've been to uh, some of CCNMTL's presentations over the years, you may well have um, been presented with this spiral. Uh, here it is again. Um, it really is the way that we work. Uh, we work um, according to a sort of an iterative process that we call design research where we start off with a curricular um, context for the work that we need to do. We try to figure out what the learning uh, need is, how it could be improved, what the challenges are, and what technology could do to help overcome some of those challenges. Uh, we draw out some hypotheses about what would work, and then we design a tool, or in this case, a whole platform. Um, we put it into the class, we implement it, we see how it goes. Um, we learn what worked, we learn what didn't work so well, and we start again, and we're quite iterative. Um, so, though this usually applies within the context of a, a specific project, the larger um, project that I just described that the center has had of really engaging students with digital materials has been around this cycle many times. And what I'm going to show you today, Media Thread, is really um, the latest chapter in a long story that began um, at least with our image, image annotation tool um, has involved Vital, which many of you who were here for the Project Rebirth session saw in action, uh, which coursed through Project Vietnam, which I'll describe a little bit, and is now MediaThread. It's not to say MediaThread has taken the place of any of these other tools, but it is standing on their shoulders and using components of them that I think you will recognize. So the IAT, for example, allows students to uh, make image collections to organize them and then to make targeted annotations on top of images um, it's in use um, largely uptown at the medical center, as you see that tooth being um, annotated there. Um, students are also able to draw shapes on top of images, and we've, uh, we've had this tool for quite some time. Vital, um, in case you did not see this uh, in action during the rebirth presentation, and in case you have not seen this tool before, um, I'll just describe a little bit of it. 
Vital is an environment that allows for a dedicated collection of videos for a class to be assembled, um, usually under the guidance of an instructor who is telling us what videos to queue up in a Vital library. The instructor is then able to correlate assignments that she writes um, that invoke the videos that have been gathered for the students. Students are able to open up these videos and make small clips of them, in other words, further subselections of them, in order to respond to the assignments from their instructors. The clips that students make in Vital collect in their own personal organization space. And then when a student is writing an essay, uh, or a longer analytic piece in Vital, uh, responding to an assignment. He is able to look through the clips that he has made, collected for this purpose, and drop them into an essay, in a sense, quoting video like you might quote uh, printed text. Um, Vital has been um, alive here at Columbia for over five years. It is used in hundreds of classes. Um, it is driving students in many different fields, ranging from social work to oral history, to film studies, to dance, um, teacher's college, uh, all over, driving them to look very closely at video because you can't do this quickly. You can't make clips um, in response to an assigned prompt quickly, you've got to look very closely at the video, you have to make decisions, you have to note to yourself why you're making that selection. Um, you've got to be strategic, you collect your clips, and then you incorporate them, you weave them into an unfolding argument. This has been a powerful model for us here at Columbia. It's probably because of Vital that when WGBH in Boston, the public television station, was given a large IMLS grant to digitize all production materials that were generated for a documentary that they made in the early 1980s called Vietnam, A Television War. It's a documentary that is about 14 hours long. It runs even now from time to time on public television. It's a powerful documentary made when memories of the war were fresh with voices, in, uh, interviews from people on all sides of the conflict, on all levels of the conflict. Um, but the documentary, as so many, um, was rotting away. The components of the documentary were rotting away. The film that was not used in the television production was trapped. And what IMLS did for WGBH is they gave them the money to go rescue this priceless material with wonderful testimony and bring them out into the light of day, digitize them, and put them uh, into a digital library where they are openly available to the public. Our role in this project was to help define curricular use of this material. So since WGBH knew that we had such traction in the challenge of looking deeply at a video library, and this is a library that is hundreds of hours of interviews, and a good deal of stock footage. They knew that we had the tools to help classes look and work very closely with this material. So we are partners with them on this grant. But when we started to try to connect Vital with the digital library that WGBH had built, we ran into a host of interesting difficulties. Um, the difficulties ranged from um, design difficulties to uh, feature redundancies um, to authentication problems. On the left, you'll see the WGBH digital library. This is a sophisticated video library with a lot of cataloging behind it a lot of great search tools. I gave you a glimpse of Vital's dedicated course library. Those are usually small, hand-picked, and pre-stocked libraries. 
So we had the challenge of thinking about, well, could we jam all of that big library into Vital, or should we be putting pieces of Vital into the big library? I showed you, or I mentioned that Vital can make, people in Vital can make clips and annotate video. WGBH had already built that functionality into their library. But they had not built the second step, which was a place to move your clips that you had made and create a sort of an, a, a larger project or an essay or an, a, a piece of analysis. So their annotation tools were in our way, in a certain way, as we were trying to think about how Vital might play with this library. And then there was the authentication question. WGBH asked people to log in and authenticate to use their tools. And we had to worry about how people at Columbia log in and are connected to classrooms to use their tools. When we started to talk to faculty par partners here at Columbia about using the WGBH library, we ran into other interesting complications. Um, Charles Armstrong in the history department was very interested in this, very excited about this source material, but he hadn't had time to go into the library to look at the hundreds of hours, obviously. WGBH was putting the materials up even as we were talking to him about what kind of assignments he might make. So he was very interested in having his students be able to go in and tag pieces and illuminate the library for each other. Furthermore, for that sort of piece of analysis, he came at it very traditionally. He was interested in the 20-page research paper backed up with rigorous use of scholarly materials. June Cross in the journalism school wasn't interested at all in an essay writing space. What she was interested in the library, uh, she was interested in the opportunity to give her students practice in the art of documentary filmmaking. Here was this test bed or this seed bed of raw material that was generated for a documentary. What could her students do to generate stories out of this? What she wanted to do was have her students go in the library, grab material, and put them into Final Cut Pro or some other sort of professional grade filmmaking tool. James Lapp, who I saw earlier today here, um, he teaches in the East Asian Languages and Cultures uh, Department. Uh, he wasn't interested in the whole range of the library, really. He was interested in pieces of the library that were in Vietnamese to help his students listen to the difference in dialects between northern, middle, and southern Vietnamese speakers. And what he wanted his students to do was to learn the variation of dialects and mimic them and then upload audio of themselves mimicking this dialect into some sort of collaborative or, or, collaborative or commonly available space. Finally, Margaret Krakow and Bill Gaudelli, who were team teaching a course on Vietnam at Teachers College, were similarly unfamiliar with the specifics of the library, similarly interested in having their students explore and discover items and point things out to each other. But they were very trained on the creation of a multimedia lesson and helping their students at Teachers College develop skills that would help them go out into schools and build multimedia lessons for children. So they were interest, interested in correlations to standards. Um, and they were very excited about actually intensifying or dignifying such um, lessons with real source material. Their oft-told anecdote on this uh, level was that uh, far and away the, the biggest reference for the Vietnam War in high school classrooms is Forrest Gump. They actually did a little survey of this. So they were very interested in the source materials. So okay, we had all these needs, we had all of these interests, and we realized that there were some features that would overlap, there were some features that would be quite different. And so again, we were faced with the question of how to bring Vital into the WGBH library, how that would connect. Would we make four different versions of the library and run each version sort of in a different way for each class? That seemed very daunting, particularly since WGBH was continuing to add more and more materials and actually change the software platform of their library halfway through. So there we were scratching our heads 
And we scratched our heads and had a lot of meetings. And uh, we finally developed a new platform that, as I say, iteratively builds on Vital. And it's called MediaThread. And the great breakthrough with this platform was that we decided to split apart the library and the analysis environment. And this was greatly counterintuitive to us, at least to me, because my specific role at the center is to think about ways in which analysis and libraries can be drawn closer together, be more actively engaged with each other. So the idea of breaking apart the library and the analysis environment was antithetical to that. But we had a very clever lever, and it's the humble bookmarklet. I don't know if anybody, who, does anyone use bookmarklets in this room? All right, so um, some of you are, are familiar with them. They're little links that you can drag up into your browser. They don't exist in a website, but they live in your browser. Um, and then you can click on them and they bookmark elements. In, uh, they can bookmark a URL of a site that you're in. And they can have a little code that takes that information and stores it somewhere. And at this moment, I really do need to uh, call out uh, Skylar Duveen, uh, the lead developer of MediaThread, for this very elegant and clever solution um, that has really made a profound difference in the way that our analysis tools and libraries can work together. And Sky keeps making a difference. Um, almost every day seems like Christmas because I come in and I learn that a new collection can be bookmarked and brought into an analysis space. So with MediaThread, we are able to open up our media analysis to a range of collections. We are no longer having to hand stock a course website in order for students to work with video or images. Uh, we are able to work with a range of collections and we're able to work with a range of formats. And I'll, show, I'll try to give you a little idea of that. And we're also able to much more easily open up media analysis to group interaction. We are able, a, a class is a sort of a forced community. And now we can bring media in a very lightweight and simple way into a communal space and encourage uh, people in that space to connect with each other based on the objects that they are studying in common or to work in groups uh, and to group up in ways that would be difficult to run in a general library. So that's a lot of talk and now I'm going to attempt a little demonstration of MediaThread to give you some idea of how this works. What I'm going to do is I'm going to pretend like I am a student in this uh, teacher's college uh, version of MediaThread um, where Project Vietnam ended up. And I'm going to pretend like I'm doing uh, a little project. Now, what I'm going to be doing is in some ways antithetical to what this technology is supposed to be doing. In other words, I'm going to be doing something very quick and superficial. I'm going to be not serious. I'm going to be dancing on source material that can be very upsetting. Um, so uh, after I do this, we'll look at what students have really done in this class and then in a few others. Now, I'm on the home page of this class. And this home page is really not going to make a lot of sense to you until I do some activity. So I'm going to skip right over to the first thing that a student would do when she first comes into MediaThread and has to do a project. In my case, I'm going to do a project on helicopters in the Vietnam War. Helicopter war, lots of interesting use of helicopters. So the instructor of a media thread class is able to line up collections that work with media thread, are compatible with media thread, um, that are appropriate to the class. So in this case, the instructors, Margaret Krakow and Bill Godelli, have chosen ArtStore, which is a database that the library subscribes to here at Columbia. They have chosen, uh, they had clips of their own 
that they wanted to bring into the mix. They had uh, captured lectures and they also had pieces of Hollywood films that they had digitized and they wanted their students to work into their lessons as well. Of course, the WGBH collection, which is now known as Open Vault, was part of uh, the kind of the reading list, if you will. And they were also interested in having their students be able to range out onto the open web and use things out there like YouTube. All right. So in this class, these are the collections that are queued up in MediaThread. And in order to use any of them, I first have to install my bookmarklet. It's not going to take me long. All I do is I click on it and I drag it up into my bookmarklet bar my bookmarks bar. Now I've got this little bookmarklet. I don't know if you can see it in the back. It just says Analyze with Media Thread. It's in my browser. I didn't have to install anything. I didn't have to restart anything. I just dragged something up there, and now I'm ready to go. Now I'm ready to enter into a digital library. So here I am in the WGBH collection. And um, I'm not going to use any of their wonderful faceted searching and browsing tools. I'm just going to do a keyword search for helicopter. All right. Well, here are some results. Uh, I'll look at this one. All right, that looks good. I'm going to use this in my project. I click my bookmarklet. Media Thread senses the asset. I click Analyze. And in it comes into Media Thread, where I can now play it again, if I would like. And I can make a small clip of it. Maybe I don't want this whole video. I just want a portion of it. I just want from here to here. I give my clip a title. And this is very vital-ish if you've, if you've used or if you've seen vital, right? So flying helicopters, I give it tags. I've been instructed by my teachers, hopefully, to be thoughtful in the ways that I'm tagging the clips that I'm making so that I can find them again. Because I'm going to be making a lot of clips, and I need to find them. So I'm going to give it a tag helicopter, um, assignment one. Um, air, raid, I don't know. And I'm also going to give myself some notes. I can put some notes here about why this particular clip is good. Nice aerials. All right. Now I'm going to save the clip. Now, if I forgot where I got this clip or what this clip is about, I'm able to click info here, and I see that metadata or information about this clip also traveled into MediaThread in, from the library. So I can see when it was made, uh, what subjects it was. But if I want to go back to the library to see where I got it from or get more information about it, I can click View Complete Record and Archive, and back I come to where I found it in the WGBH library. So what am, I, what am I doing here? I am traveling back and forth between a publicly available site and a course site that only I can access and my students. I'm bringing things in from WGBH into this private course space. I'm ignoring WGBH's annotation tools, because I've got ones of my own that I'm using in my course space. All right, well, now I want to do another uh, search here for, I want to hear about a helicopter pilot and his experience. One really nice thing about this library is that WGBH has done transcripts of all of their interviews and these are searchable. This is work that is hard work and was labor intensive and we were very glad not to have to do but be able to provide to students. So I want to find out when this man talks about helicopters. And I find that he makes mention of them here. I can sync to that spot. Hopefully it won't take too long to come up.
this might be a good time to say that um, when I'm bookmarking materials and bringing them into MediaThread, I am well, not a, copying a them. A tab unit or, or a, um, is basically made up of, uh, it has loaches or light observation helicopters, which, and we had the use model. It has UEs or slicks. Okay, this is perfect for my project. I want to bring it into MediaThread. Click Analyze with MediaThread, Analyze, and it comes, queued up to where I was before. Should have been. But what I started to say was, I didn't copy this video. I am only referencing this video. So I'm dependent on WGBH's servers to stream it for me, which is also a very nice thing for us here at Columbia. Somebody else is taking the burden of hosting the material and streaming it. All right, in any case, uh, I'm going to make a clip here. Ready to fly, had no other experience outside of flight school. This was 1970 odd, and there have been a lot of uh, protests, and America seemed to be a bit split about the war. How did you feel about actually going to get Notes if I want, I'm going to save my clip. All right, well, WGBH has a lot of great stuff, but my professors have also uh, set up a dedicated course space. I'm going to sign into that. I'm going to look at the media collection. The Ride of the Valkyries from Apocalypse Now. What do you think? Wow, that's really exciting, man. No, no, the waves! The waves! Oh, right. Look at that. Break both ways. Watch. Watch. Oh, go six Fantastic for my project. In it comes. Where you get the idea. I can clip it. This time I'm going to save the whole thing. And I'm just going to tag it, the whole thing. I could give it notes, too. All right, well, there are other collections queued up here. Uh, my professors are inviting me to go out onto the open web. So let's see what is there. And here I have to be careful, because I've learned that YouTube has this very unfortunate genre of helicopter crashes, <laughs> which is just awful, really. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> the four-man American patrol operating in Haunia province has fallen victim to fire on... All right, well, let's say that's what I want. And I click my same bookmarklet, and in it comes into my same analysis space. I've taken it now from YouTube, where I can again play it. The four-man American patrol... ...who's by God. Okay, so I saved my clip. And finally, I noticed that there is an image uh, collection here, Art Store. Huh, never really used Art Store much before. What's that all about? I'm going to go look and see if uh, helicopters in Vietnam come up as a search there. Oh, I see some images here. I'm just going to click on one to see what it's all about. Looks like this is a uh, member of the National Liberation Front who has shot down an American helicopter and is showing a picture of it. Interesting. I'm going to bring it into media thread. And it comes, uh, again, in my familiar analysis space, but now with some tools from Art Store that allow me to zoom in and move around. Also with metadata from Art Store, so I know more information about it. It's with here, with it. Okay, so I've made a bunch of clips. I'm ready to write my project. To do so, I go into Items and Projects, where over here is a collection of all the clips that I've made during this class. Now, 
these are all my saved items. I can filter them, so because I have a lot here, um, you know, I'm using this course, I'm using this over the co long course, so I can filter them by tags that I made today, or clips that I made today, or yesterday, or within the last week, or I can filter them by tag. So I can call up all the clips that I just made that were tagged helicopters. When I'm ready to create a new project, I give it a title. I write my analysis or my introduction, let's say. When I'm ready to drop in a clip to prove my point, I do so and I keep writing. Again, I'm just showing you the functionality. If I want to refresh my memory about what any of these clips are, I can look at them right in the editing space. Oh yeah, that was the right one. That's good. I can also look at the notes that I made to refresh my memory about why I've made this clip. All right, that's good. Well, I want to save it. I'm not ready to share it with anybody yet. I can save it as a draft. I can also work on a group project. So if I am working with somebody else in the class, here are all the people in the class. Devin and I are working on this project together. I can add Devin just like that. Now when I save it, Devin can see it as well. So Devin and I both belong to this project. When Devin comes to this page, Devin will see, I think it's his, his own items that he has collected, but he will see the exact same workspace that I see, and he can move in objects into this workspace as well. Either Devin and I could also range around and look at what other people have collected. So I could go into Devin's space right now and see what he's collected, or anybody else in the class, or I could look at all class items. I can filter this list of all class items and scan it. Um, say instead I'll do brutality. And I could move this in and incorporate it into my project. The point here is that students are able to look in each other's workspaces in MediaThread. They're able to poke around. I can protect my projects. I don't have to share my projects until I'm ready to. But the clips that I have made, the tags that I have used, the annotations that I have done are all accessible to anybody else in the class. This was in response to our faculty members, our partners, saying that they wanted students to help each other find things. Um, and so this was a way to respond to that. When I'm done with my project, I can save it in a variety of ways. I can save it so that just the instructor can see it, so I'm just submitting it in sort of an old-fashioned way. I can save it so that anybody in the course can see it, or I can save it so that anybody in the world can see it. If I do that, MediaThread generates a little URL that I'm able to email to my mom to tell her, to show her my great new project that I've built in MediaThread. Now, if mom is not on the Columbia network or not in an institution that has access to the protected elements here, she won't be able to see them. But she'll be able to see that YouTube clip. She'll be able to see the um, open vault materials from WGBH. She'll be able to see anything that I've used that is publicly accessible. My roommate, who's not a member of the class, will be able to see everything that I've used because my roommate has the same authentication uh, is using it on the network at, here at Columbia. All right, now back to the home page might make a little bit more sense now that you've seen me do some work here. On the home page, we have an instructor's focus box. This is a place where an instructor, if an instructor builds a project and publishes it for the class, it shows up here. This is a way for an instructor to quickly put up a syllabus, put up a model assignment, put up some directions, and publish it using the same tools that students are using to respond to assignments. Over here, 
I've got a list of the top tags that are being used in the class, another way to sort of foster that group discovery. So if I clicked one of them, I would go back into items and projects and it would be filtered by, let's say, women. And I'd be able to see all the resources that everybody in the class has tagged women. Under that is a little uh, feed called updates to my items. We think of this as something like a Facebook feed. These are updates to things that are in my network, if you will. So if I have brought a video in to the analysis space and I've worked with it and I've saved it, and then somebody else does work with the same video, I get alerted in this feed. Somebody else is working on your, on a, you have a piece of media in common. This is to encourage students to discover each other's work collaterally in a media thread class. Likewise, if I belong to a project with somebody else, Devin and I are sharing a project, if he goes into the project and makes changes, this feed lets me know that as well. So it's a way for me to sort of track what's going on with things that I am invested in in MediaThread. If I have media in here, if somebody else is using it, I'll know about it. Similarly, if a project is being used, I'll know about it. Now in this particular class, um, the instructors opted to use another component of MediaThread class discussions. This is optional, only, a st only an instructor can create a discussion, but what Bill and Margaret wanted to do at Teachers College was to scaffold their students' use of MediaThread because it's a complicated environment, it takes a little practice. So before they sort of said, okay, build me a multimedia lesson plan, they had, you know, baby step uh, exercises uh, and one of them was participate in a discussion. So if I'm participating in a discussion about the fall of Saigon, for example, it's the same idea. The discussion thread is here. I can respond to what Rachel is saying here. Well, I think I can filter to an item that makes, that proves my response or that bolsters it and move that item in and I can save the comment. So we have a threaded discussion board uh, that has access to all of the clips that I have made and stored in MediaThread and everybody else's. All right, so that is a whirlwind tour of MediaThread. Let's look at a real project in MediaThread. I'm gonna go look at Ashley because she always says some really smart things in class. I kinda wanna know what she's collecting and I want to know what her lesson plan is. She's published it so that anybody in the class can see it. I'm going to look at it. Okay, it looks like it's a lesson plan about the experience of women in the Vietnam War. She's uh, imagining that it's pitched at the 10th grade level and that'll take 90 minutes. She's defined an essential question. She's defined learning standards and objectives, very traditional. And now she has activities that these 10th graders will do, and they include looking at pictures of women during the Vietnam War, which she's saved in media thread and dropped in, and listening to a series of interviews about the experience of being a woman in the Vietnam War, including uh, Viet Cong women, Viet Minh women, treatment of the Vietnamese women by, in, in, uh, by the United States. Now, a lot of these interviews are actually in Vietnamese, so I'm not sure what 10th grade cohort Ashley's thinking about here. Um, hey, it was this one mama song that I knew. We call it mama song. That means an adult. You know, it's a lady. She worked on the base. She was very knowledgeable lady, uh, very decent. Another one I knew was Sal and um, Sin. I became very good friends at the end. So this is a soldier talking about women that he knew. She's also bringing in some Hollywood clips. <laughs> Depiction of a prostitute in full metal jacket. All 
Okay, so that was the multimedia lesson plan as it has been developing at Teachers College with MediaThread. Um, again, our partners were Margaret Krakow and, and Bill Godelli, and the educational technologist uh, from CCNMTL that has been working with them is Maria Ginelli. I'm not sure if Maria's in the room. Oh, there you are, Maria. Hi. Um, and she's been helping Margaret and Bill uh, apply this technology to their course. Um, and Margaret and Bill have had some nice things to say about the way it's been going. Uh, I feel very self-conscious putting up a lot of text after Michael Senemo's uh, uh, presentation about PowerPoint, so I won't read all of this. Uh, but I will just point out that Bill is celebrating MediaThread's ability to send kids out into what he calls an open context that allows them to explore digital materials that he himself has not looked at yet and to actually have an input and to shape the class. Um, and Margaret Krakow is uh, focused on how she was able to build scaffolding exercises in MediaThread. So she was able to have students do little projects like go find a piece of media, bring it in, clip and tag it. And then, okay, now participate in a discussion that uses what you found. And then, okay, now build a lesson plan uh, that is informed by the media that you're finding online. Okay, I'm gonna look at another pioneering class using MediaThread this fall. Um, and I should say, we've had beta classes using MediaThread, although this is the first sort of official display and rollout of it at Columbia. This is uh, a class that has been taught by Gray Tuttle in the past and is currently being taught by Annabella Pitkin in the East An Asian Languages and Cultures Department called Engaging Digital Tibet. The educational technologist that has been working with them is Tucker Harding, I see him standing there in the back. Tucker has been working with Gray and Annabella for some time, way before MediaThread, in order to help them uh, develop an assignment called the Object Biography. What they really are interested in doing is having their students look very, very closely at an object. This is a class that is focused on material history in Tibet. So what students do is they go in and at the beginning of the semester they claim an object. It's their object. They're going to look deeply at this object throughout the semester and their culminating paper is going to be what they call an object biography. So they came to us asking if we had tools that would allow students to closely, closely annotate objects. So if you'll bear with me, I'm gonna switch into their course. So a while back, with help uh, with libra from librarians in Star East Asian Library, we built them a custom collection space and we solicited museums in the area that had really good pictures of material objects to give them to us uh, so that students could have their choice of objects to write object biographies and we brought them into this digital library. We worked out the tiling and, the, and the, uh, the, the mechanics of being able to load an image quickly, but a rich image that you could really, really scroll up and see detail here. This skull figure that I didn't even notice here. In an earlier version of this project, we also built annotation tools like the image annotation tool that I showed you, where a student could just plop a point uh, right on that skull and write a little paragraph about it, like notice how this skull is shaped this way, notice the holes in the ear. But after experimenting with that, that was exciting to these instructors, but they really wanted these annotations, these anchored, targeted, close annotations to be folded into an analytic framework. Luckily we had MediaThread up and running, we could do that. So I can bring this object into MediaThread, where I can again come up very closely to it. I can draw on it to point out something. Um, and save it. All right, so let's look at an actual project done in MediaThread. I'm gonna look at 
Henry's saved objects. Here Henry is writing about a dance apron. This is his object. He's claimed it, he's all over it. He's going to uh, annotate it, and he's dropping those annotations into an object biography. He's pointing out places, details. He's comparing it to other similar objects in the library. And he's reaching out to YouTube to give us a sense of how these objects were actually used. So that's the object biography as it now exists in MediaThread, uh, allowing for that close-up targeted annotation, but also allowing for context around that, uh, those annotations. And Annabella uh, gave us these reactions to how it went last semester. Again, I'm not going to read them all, but I will point out that she was excited about the way that th what was a conventional essay that was full of paraphrase has turned into a much more, what she calls a multifaceted thing. And she th says that it allows her students to think visually and spatially and to think about how the objects that they're analyzing closely fit into the culture. Um, she also feels like the ability for students to bring in items and to make connections that she didn't necessarily think about was a way for the students to learn new things for themselves. And she says that it spurred her creativity as well as student creativity. Okay, the last real life um, example that I'm going to show you is up at the medical center. Uh, Alfredo Morabia uh, teaches a course called the History of Epidemiology in the School of Public Health. And his interest in media thread was in helping to uh, having it help him redefine what it meant to present epidemiology. Uh, he didn't want his students to read a succession of scientific papers or a textbook. He wanted them to gain a deeper appreciation for the cultural narrative, the representations of these epidemics as they happen, to get a historical sense of the ap epidemics and to connect that historical sense to the science. So the way that he's using MediaThread, and he's doing it right now, I mean, even as we speak, I think he teaches on Friday, uh, he has his students go out onto the open web as well as into a, web, uh, a collection that he has built and find cultural representations, tag them in such a way that they can in class all look at what everybody has brought in for that day. They can have a discussion about which objects are best representative of certain historical realities or conceptions. Uh, and in that way, students are able to sort of like queue up the conversation. So let's go into their media thread class. So again, the collections that Professor Morabia has queued up, this is a custom collection that we built for him full of uh, PDFs of articles with charts and graphs that he wanted students to work with. Uh, we created a space in Flickr where students can upload images that they find and then bring them into the analysis space and also YouTube comes into play. So for this one, I think I'm going to go to Paula who's going to tell me a little about, about scurvy. First of all, let's just take a look at all the things that Paula has been collecting here. It's an interesting range. Statistical charts and graphs, illustrations, images, pieces of media like the History Channel. Her report on scurvy, 
talks about the various conceptions of scurvy uh, before it was linked to vitamin C, or before remedying scurvy was linked to vitamin C. So we're able to see various, here's Native Americans curing scurvy with pine tea. This is a theory published in 1914 that humidity uh, and blocked perspiration caused scurvy. If, if that's the case, I'm feeling like I might be coming down with scurvy in this hot room. <laughs> this was uh, an experiment conducted by some person named Lind. where he brought a number of items uh, together to see what seemed to work to cure scurvy. Sulfuric acid, vinegar, salt water, oranges and lemons, spice paste, barley water, and a control. And finally, this is a picture of the Battle of Trafalgar, which she talks about the, the British winning in large part because they had figured out that scurvy was connected to lemons or could be combated by lemons. In any case, uh, here's an example of uh, an epidemiology class really engaging in history and sifting through historical representations in order to get a deeper understanding of an epidemic. It's one thing to say, you know, it's one thing to connect um, scurvy with vitamin C. It's another to really understand the narrative of how that was discovered. Professor Morabia, he's from Europe, so he gets to say things like this. Uh, American students feel like the past is a black hole. Uh, by searching and annotating documents expressing how it was like to live in other centuries, students acquire context. Uh, he likes that media thread, uh, gives them that sort of historical context, but allows them to work in what he feels is their preferred information gathering space, the web. We also have other uh, professors here at Columbia who have been beta testers of MediaThread. Uh, they're at TC. Uh, ELAC is a strong user, I think thanks in large part to Tucker. Um, our very own Frank Moretti has been piloting it at, uh, in his History of Communication course. Jane Gaines is using it for two classes that are studying the history of the documentary film. Also another use up at Mailman. So, as we look at these sort of emerging uses, um, it's, a, it's a certain amount of satisfaction uh, that they connect with priorities that we've been working on for quite some time at the center. Last enemy, I talked about digital bridges, which is our strategic initiative to more closely engage structured collections in learning environments. And we've laid out these hypotheses three years ago, and MediaThread is really giving us the means to pursue these hypotheses. Um, and they are that communal activities that uh, are built around collective engagement of defined libraries raises the quality and amount of peer interaction centered around the subject matter being studied. Uh, we also feel that if students are able to work in an environment that is fed at least in some part, not only by the YouTubes and the Flickers of the world, but also by Open Vault, art store and these managed resources, uh, that they will get a higher awareness of provenance, rights, access, and in, in other words, that they will become more digitally literate. They'll know where their sources are coming from. Uh, we had the hypothesis a long time back that if you bring sources, source materials together from different collections, if you weren't constrained by the artificial, sometimes, boundaries of one collection, uh, that these source materials will lend themselves much more readily to faculty-defined assignments and the kind of interdisciplinary discovery that I think we're seeing going on in the epidemiology class, right? Which is much involved now with history. And then finally, we had a hypothesis that uh, incorporating collections into our learning environments in innovative ways will really allow our library partners many of whom I see here in the room, to better understand user needs and priorities. And to that end, uh, 
This is a little pie chart of the library's materials acquisitions budget for fiscal year 10, over $20 million. That green chunk are electronic journals and databases, more than books, almost $8 million. We've been working with a selected number of licensed databases in order to make them what we kind of arrogantly call maybe media thread compliant. <laughs> what does media thread compliance mean? It's really pretty simple. I mean, it seems simple to me. Sky, Skylar would say I, I may, might have a, a, a deeper response there. But it really means that these libraries, these databases, need to present their materials so that there is a predictable address for them, so that Bookmarklet knows where to look and to lift it out. And actually, we're not copying it, we're just referencing it. So we depend on a, a digital library to have a very clear and stable place where that image or that video lives so that it can be bookmarked and referenced in an analysis environment. Seems simple, you would be surprised at how many library database vendors don't do this or have some pop-up window that makes it difficult to actually use some sort of bookmarking tool. We are also fairly dismayed at the number of database vendors who are now starting to build in clipping, tagging, annotating tools that live in their products only. We're seeing this happen. We're, I mean, we're dismayed, we're happy. We're happy that they're understanding that there is a sort of up-close analytic use of their materials. But we do not want our students and our faculty to have to have collections stashed in a Gale product or an Elsevier product. They don't think that way. We want to build these course-defined spaces where these collections can be amassed, can be referenced, can be used, and can be published. So we are, sometimes when we're feeling combative about this, we, we think of it as a manifesto. We're trying to draw priorities that as the library works out contracts and agreements with database providers, they can represent these priorities. And the database providers are often, in our early experience with this, very happy to have this kind of conversation. Art Store in particular has been a great uh, partner for us because they realize that if they make their content easy to find and important to analysis spaces, that we will become their emissaries and we will make people more aware of what is an art store. Charles Armstrong, for example, the history professor, had no idea of the deep uh, photo uh, collections uh, that are pertinent for uh, his presentation of the Vietnam War in art store. Um, the more that these databases can be flexibly invoked uh, by tools like MediaThread, the more they're actually going to be used. Um, and also, because MediaThread is confined to a course website, we're not copying the materials, we're not distributing them outside of a very controlled space. So ArtStore, which has a lot of, a lot of lawyers, um, is very comfortable with this. Okay, so finally, uh, the open future of MediaThread. Um, I keep coming to work, Skylar keeps coming to work, we all keep coming to work, more collections, start to play in MediaThread. As faculty come up to us and say, we need this collection, I have these resources, could I use it in a space like this? We will do that work to make that happen. We are also very eager to build more features and improve what we've started with MediaThread and we're eager to do that in partnership collaboration with faculty. We're eager for faculty partners to help us imagine the kinds of assignments that can be done in a collective space like this. We're interested in the ways in which some components of MediaThread, like clipping and annotating, could be integrated in other environments that uh, students are using at Columbia, more mainstream environments like CourseWorks, for example. We're fielding a lot of interest from outside uh, outside institutions, and I actually wrote down a little list because we gave a little sneak peek of this at uh, a conference called the Open Video Conference a couple of weeks ago. Uh, in the next few days, the Applied Learning Institute at ASU, Avid Video, Broadway Video, 
Bucknell University, BBC Archives, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, the Internet Archive, Mozilla, and Opencast Matterhorn all asked for sandboxes in MediaThread because it really is a fairly compelling model. Uh, we are releasing the code openly. Uh, you're welcome to download it, install it, and run it. Um, there it is. Uh, there's a small developer community that is forming around it. MIT has actually run MediaThread courses this fall. They have done, I believe, a Shakespeare course using MediaThread. We're delighted with this. We know that um, if we distribute the development in this way, it will make for a stronger product. So anybody who wants to play with this or talk to us about MediaThread or get started with this, we can switch on a MediaThread course for you instantly. It can work with a range of collections instantly. Shoot us an email at ccnmtl-mediathread or just email me, Mark Phillipson, mlp55 at columbia.edu or just stroll into our faculty support lab and uh, help us uh, advance this, uh, this model. Thank you.